You are watching Niagara Votes 2019. I'm Grant LaFleche from the St. Catharines Standard, and we're doing another chat with the candidates for the St. Catharines riding for the upcoming election on October the 21st. And with us now is Travis Mason from the Green Party running in St. Catharines. Travis, welcome to the St. Catharines Standard newsroom. Thanks for having me, Grant. It's great to be here. Um, before we get into any sort of serious policy questions for the benefit of our viewers and readers who don't know you, um, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, where are you from? Why are you running? All right. Uh, well, I'm from St. Catharines. I grew up here. Um, my dad worked at General Motors for 35 years, so I'm fully aware of all the politics involved with uh, strikes and layoffs and all that. Uh, but we lived a good life. Uh, those jobs are disappearing now. Uh, I went to Brock University uh, to get a BA in English. And then I went out west to pursue uh, graduate studies, and I ended up getting a PhD in English from uh, from the University of British Columbia. Okay. And I focused on Canadian literatures, uh, post-colonial world literatures, and the environment. And my goal after that was to to secure a tenured position as a faculty member uh, at some university in Canada. And I learned that those jobs, uh, just like manufacturing jobs in St. Catharines, uh, were becoming more and more scarce. Exactly. Uh, and so after seven years of contract work on the East Coast, mostly, at Dalhousie and Mount Allison University, uh, I came back home. I, I left academia, came back home, and, I, and then I got a job delivering mail for Canada Post for the past four years. Okay. And I met a wonderful woman, and I uh, live with her and her three kids. And that's pretty much why I'm running for uh, the Green Party. Uh, just looking at the future for, for children, our youth, and having the time to to be reacquainted with uh, my home city of St. Catharines by delivering mail on foot and by getting taxied back and forth and just seeing the different neighborhoods and the good things, of course, uh, since I left and came back, uh, but also you know, the not so good things that we, that we need to address. W what did you notice and what jumped out at you for somebody who you know, had left for some time and, and came back? Is, is there anything that you see from that street level view as a, as a postal worker? motivated you to run or that you want to see addressed uh, if, if you know, once you get elected or before the Green Party holds you know, enough sway in the next right. parliament to, to get their attention? Well, I think definitely it is a combination of the good and the bad. I mean, the, the downtown uh, has certainly improved since I left. Uh, came back, I left in 2000, came back in 2014. I, I did visit on occasion. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the PAC and the Meridian Center and uh, other small businesses are, are helping the downtown be a more welcoming, uh, vibrant place. Uh, but I've also seen just greater disparity uh, between neighborhoods and um, increasing homelessness. Uh, the opioid crisis is obviously a problem. Housing affordability is a big issue um, that's spiked in, in the years even since I've been back. Uh, and so these are all reasons that I think it's important um, uh, to run for federal politics. And the Green Party shares a lot of the same values that I do. Uh, ideas regarding how we can address these issues. I mean, affordable housing is one that just keeps coming up. So, sorry, we're good? Um, yeah. Affordable housing is one of these issues that keeps coming up in the campaign. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I want to get your thoughts on this in particular because it's, it, you look at downtown St. Catharines, which has had this explosion of, I mean, obviously crime more recently, mm -hmm. but it, you know, we see more homelessness, more people in need of mental health assistance. Um, more crime, the opioid crisis exacerbating all of that. And at the same time, it's not just social housing supply is, is diminishing, but just uh, affordable housing for people who are you know, low income, middle income folk are having a harder time finding a place they can afford to live in. From the Green Party's point of view, how does Ottawa begin to address some of that, particularly on the affordable housing side? It, what can Ottawa do or what should Ottawa be doing? Well, so th these, things are all connected. You mentioned a whole lot of things right there, right? And they're all very much connected. And I think the Green Party is well positioned uh, as an ecolo ecologically minded and scientifically minded party to recognize those connections. Yep. Uh, and so what can we do? Obviously, we need to, to sort of probably increase transfers through certain um, policies to the provinces and municipalities. Uh, I think the municipalities only get about 10 cents on every dollar through taxes. We would look to increase to double that at least to municipalities as well as 1% of G GST um, going to municipalities specifically for housing. Mm -hmm. um, we also just need to incentivize developers to, to build purpose-built rental units. Right? At least a third of Canadians right now, uh, and the Niagara region is no exception, 
are, are renters, right? I've been a renter for most of my adult life. Yeah. And um, it's, it's just kind of the real reality of things. Home ownership is becoming increasingly more difficult. Um, prices are skyrocketing. My dad's lived in his home since the late 1960s, and um, he'll get a great price on it, but where's he gonna go to downsize, mm -hmm. right? He might get 400 grand, but then to find a one bedroom or two bedroom condo, that's out of, that's out of the question. Uh, so we, d we, we need to incentivize through um, tax breaks to, toward to developers to get them to, to focus on not homes for sale, especially the big large ones that are increasingly unnecessary, but on, on rental units and co-ops and provide uh, more funding to, to those kinds of organizations to, to focus on social housing. Uh, it, it would be almost impossible to do an interview with a Green Party candidate without talking climate change, uh, which has become certainly one of the largest issues of this campaign um, during the English, le English language leaders debate. Elizabeth May you know, constantly returned to climate change and hitting targets and et cetera, et cetera, time and time again. Um, a lot of the oxygen in that debate gets focused on gas tax or cri carbon pricing. Um, there seems to be a broad uh, agreement among, amongst economists that carbon pricing or carbon taxing is an effective way to reduce emissions, provided that tax is high enough to impact consumer or industrial uh, consumption and, and production of emissions. Emissions in the country continue to rise. In BC, they've kind of held the line a little bit, um, but you know, despite the the federal liberals saying, well, we're three quarters of the way there. Certainly your leader thinks that, that we're not going to hit those targets or the approach is wrong. So from, from your point of view, from the Green Party point of view, I mean, are, are we on the right track with the gas tax as they exist? Should, I mean, should they be set higher? Should that rebate be less? Or are there other things that we ought to be doing as a nation uh, to reduce emissions to a point that will actually have an impact? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely more things we can be doing. I think the, the pollution pricing as it stands right now, uh, again, in British Columbia, it's, sho it's shown to be uh, fairly effective, but it can't be only that. Uh, the, the other parties' targets are, even if they do meet them, which they're not on track to do, as many studies suggest, uh, they're, not, they're, not, uh, they're not enough, those targets. The Green Party uh, is proposing to double the targets from the Harper years, which uh, the Liberals uh, are sticking to. And that's what's necessary in order to, to reach net zero by 2050. And so what we need to do in addition to putting a price on pollution is preventing the pollution in the first place by keeping carbon in the ground, which is why no new pipelines. And we need to phase out existing pipelines and provide uh, assistance for those who work in that sector to mm. transition into, into a greener economy. The, the, uh, to play devil's advocate, I mean, one of the criticisms of that line of thinking, right? Shut down the oil sands in Alberta, phase out the pipelines we have, certainly no new pipelines. I mean, the pipeline odyssey in this country has been going on for several years now. That you know, we don't have the kind of broad use of uh, green technology in our transportation sector in, in, in moving goods and people around the country effectively. The technology is not there to replace both, the, say, vehicles and also how we're going to fuel and power those vehicles. So. If you were to keep all the carbon in the ground, if you didn't build new pipelines and phased out the existing ones, I mean, how does a country this spread out and this diverse move people and goods across country? How do we power our businesses if we're, we don't seem to have, at least, and, and you can tell me you think I'm wrong, we don't have the technology really to replace you know, the, the, the combustion engine, essentially, and, and the, the resources we need to run it? Well, I think the technology is there. It might not be ready yet for this massive um, application, but Canadians are a resilient bunch, I think. And we've always been a vast country, sparsely populated, to quote Northrop Fry, and we can find a way. We have the people, we have uh, the, the knowledge and the skills. It's just something that has to be done. Do, 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 you, do you think then by, say, phasing out pipelines? I mean, in the same way that the gas tax or carbon pricing is supposed to impact behavior to lead you to do something else that doesn't incur that cost. I mean, is that the thinking here as well? If you start phasing out the pipelines, you start reducing production from the tar sands, that this will just kind of force us to do something else, to not rely on, on that source of fuel and, and turn to other alternatives. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think Elizabeth May made a good point 
um, on CBC when she said, you know, we're not asking Canadians to give up much, really. It's, it's, it's an adjustment in behavior that we can help uh, to, to foster. So instead of going to the, to the gas pumps to fill up your car, you're plugging it in. And we're going to ensure with uh, a, a Canadian electric grid that there will be places to do that, right? Whether it's, you know, federal um, office buildings or Canada Post offices where we can provide opportunities for people to, to charge their cars instead of filling them up. Right. Um, a couple of quick questions. These are from uh, what we put out on Twitter that we're doing these chats. We asked uh, readers uh, what you questions. Got a lot of questions. We did, and, but there's two that came out, and, and the first one will be very easy for you to answer. <coughs> Excuse me, which is, uh, from your own personal view, do you accept that uh, human activity is exacerbating uh, climate change? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, actually, the, the, the very last article that I published uh, in a scholar, scholarly journal mm -hmm. uh, was my first sort of foray, foray into uh, more historical literatures. Right. And I looked at some letters published in 1818 uh, in the Halifax Recorder, I believe it was, okay. by a gentleman who went by the name of Agricola. And he was a, he was a Scottish immigrant farmer. Uh, who, and I forget his, his real name, but Agricola he went by. And he was arguing for, based on the science at the time, yeah. which wasn't really science, uh, but he was arguing that on the East Coast, they needed to cut down as many trees as possible, not just to make space for crops, but right. because the consensus was, among many people, that cutting down more trees would help warm the atmosphere. <laughs> so this has been a goal, albeit indirectly, perhaps, yeah. all along, or, or, or in a way that they didn't quite know what was going to happen, but the goal has been to warm the climate all along. Right. And we've succeeded in ways we could never have predicted. And if we could go back, we might have done things a little bit differently. Uh, the other uh, question is, from your own personal point of view, uh, what is your view on a woman's right to choose? Absolutely 100% is a woman's right to choose. I've always felt that. I will never waver on that. It's not even a question for me. And uh, as we're, we're wrapping up here, uh, Travis, I mean, it's interesting because Elizabeth May had said uh, earlier in the campaign, maybe she knows the Green Party is not forming the next government, at least not as the prime minister, presumably. I don't know. Yeah, you don't know. But, but, she, but she, did, she did put this idea out there that, uh, you know, her kind of aim is to get enough seats in the House that in this, mm -hmm. particularly in the event of a minority government, that the Greens will have much more influence. Mm -hmm. um, may, I mean, kind of quickly make your case. I mean, why should people vote for a party that, uh, at the, at the, you know, the, the end goal appears to be to be able to be that conscience or that third party of weight in the House as opposed to necessarily forming the government. Well, I think one of the things I like about the Green Party and Elizabeth May is that we aim to do politics differently. Uh, but it's difficult to do with the current first-past-the-post system. Um, so my position is that the Liberals and Conservatives will look to St. Catharines as a bellwether riding to help them achieve power again, right? And I just ask the people of St. Catharines, how badly do we need another liberal or conservative member of parliament representing our city? Um, what, what would happen if we elected a green member of parliament to help Elizabeth May and the Green Party, not to take over parliament, but again, to have some, some uh, diverse voices in there and to help shape policy in responsible, ethical ways. Okay. That's what I think I can do with my experience and my education. All right. Thank you so much, Travis. Thank you, Grant. Uh, you've been watching Chat with the Candidates for Niagara Votes 2019. I'm Grant LaFleche from the St. Catherine Standard. And just to remind you to tune back into our website on October 21st, Election Day starting at 8 p.m. for our election show. Of course, after you've gone to the polls and voted. Thanks for watching.